uh, I wanted to get up and kind of share with you before this video comes up. Um, th this is kind of a lengthy one. Um, it's about 11 minutes and 20 seconds long, so just pay attention as we go through. It has a lot to do with the message that we'll be sharing this morning. So. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's workmanship, His masterpiece. I don't know about you, but when I get up in the morning and look in the mirror, I don't really see a, a masterpiece, you know? I mean, maybe a Picasso. It's like, <laughs> but I want to be his masterpiece. I want to be everything he created me to be. And so I go to him in prayer and I say, dear heavenly father, do whatever it takes to mold me into the image of your son. Make me your masterpiece. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Hi. Whoa. Who are you? I'm God. You said the prayer, so here I am. You're not God. No, I am. You said the prayer. That's how it works. Okay, okay. If you're God, then uh, make it snow in here. You know what? I really don't want to make it snow in here because it'd get kind of yucky. Yeah, you're not God. Why do you say that? God wouldn't say yucky. I do. It's a Greek word. Oh. Okay, okay. Um, if you're God, what does Lamentations 15.9 say? Lamentations is only five chapters. It's a very short book. Oh. Why was it so short? I was tired of lamenting. Oh. Okay, okay. If you're God, who's going to win the World Series this year? I'm really not into playing games. Why are you so much into playing games? You are God. What well, gave it away? You answered my question with a question. I did? <sighs> yeah, I do that. Don't I? I did it again. <laughs> Step right up. Here we go. Okay. All right. Hey, what are we doing? I'm going to make you my original masterpiece. This is the process. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. Wait, wait. What are these about? These are the tools I'm going to use to make you into my original masterpiece. Okay. Yeah. Hang on. Yeah. I thought you were a carpenter. That's my son. Step right up. Here we go. Okay. Oh, hey, God. Mm -hmm. How do you know what to chisel away and what to leave? I take out everything in your life that doesn't belong there, kind of like dead weight. Ooh, speaking of dead weight, could you chisel right here? It showed up when I was in my 20s and grew around and became back fat. I don't even know why you created that, but I can't get rid of it. I mean, I've tried everything. Like, I tried running, I tried lifting weights. My wife actually talked me into trying Pilates. That was awkward, but I can't get rid of it. So if you would just chisel around here, and then, you know what, if you chisel a line right here and maybe four to five, maybe eight lines right here. That would be awesome. You're funny. You made me that way. I also made the platypus. With the platypus? All I'm saying is most of my children, when it comes to this process, they just want to talk, but they don't want to do the work. So do you want to talk or can I chisel? Talk, chisel, No, talk, no, chisel. no, 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 no. I choose to chisel. All right. Through my Holy Spirit, I'm going to bring up things in your life that I want you to work on. Like your anger. I created the emotion, but you use it in the wrong way. Um, you compare yourself to others instead of me. You tell little white lies because you want to people please. You're lazy. But you try to fool everybody by looking really, really busy. You have a problem with lust? Well, time out. <laughs> I don't really have a problem with lust. You don't have a problem with lust. No, I can do it anytime I want. <sighs> Hang on a second. I mean, I, I got to admit, I, mean, I feel like you've been doing some great work and I'm looking pretty good right now. All right, when you look in the mirror, who do you see? I see me. Okay, then I need to keep chiseling away because ultimately you and other people need to see my son. Okay, don't misunderstand me. It's just um, when I look more like Jesus, people get uncomfortable around me. I mean, even my church friends and they're like, oh, you're holier than thou, you know? And, and I, don't, I don't think I'm supposed to make people uncomfortable. So what you're saying is you'd rather play God in certain areas of your life than for me to be God over your whole life. That is not what I said. It's what you meant. Yes, it is. Um, it's hard to talk to you. You know everything that I'm thinking. I'm just saying you've done some great work. Maybe we take a break, a sabbatical from each other, you know. I'll stay right here and then, you That's know. That's just it. You never just stay right there. You're either moving toward me or away from me, but never you just stay. What you're doing is called control. Do you want to control things in your life or can I chisel? Control, chisel, control, no, chisel. No, chisel, chisel. All right. But can we chisel where I want? That's called control. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Now this right here, this secret sin that you keep running to whenever you're hurting, angry, lonely, tired, that you think you're fooling everybody, but it's making you a whitewashed tomb. Are you ready for me to chisel this out of your life? Yeah. 
see it's a process. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. It's your whole life. And you care so deeply about what other people think of you. It's rubbish, it's garbage. The greatest thing you're ever gonna hear is at the end of your life when you hear me say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what you keep your eye on. That's the prize, heavenward. Oh, that hurts. Oh, trust me, this hurts me more than it hurts you. Right. Okay, I'm sorry. I just, I don't think you understand this pain. Pardon me? You're asking me to sacrifice a lot, God. Don't talk to me about sacrifice. I know all about sacrifice. I sent my son to die on the cross for pain, for sin, but I also did it for another reason, to give you freedom. Do you know what insanity is? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. And there are things that you've been doing for years these empty wells that don't have anything to offer. You've been going to them and it's insane. Allow me to chisel them out of your life. Um, allow me to produce character where you keep focusing so much on your image. Okay, but I was thinking. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Okay, but if we went another way. Your ways are not oh, my ways. Oh, I can't. You can't what? I, I, I can't be good. That's your excuse. That's your excuse is that you can't be good. It's not an excuse, I can't. Oh, my child, in the beginning, I said it was good. I made you good. Be good. Yeah, but you and I both. What? Nothing. No, what is it? Nothing, okay? You wouldn't understand. I, God of all the universe, wouldn't understand something one of my children has to say. Try me. It's just, um, I let you down so many times, God. No, my child. You were never holding me up. I hold you up with my victorious, righteous right hand. Never the other way around. In this relationship, I hold you up. Okay. And chisel away. But just, just be prepared for what you're gonna find in there. Because I know who's inside there. Because I get up every morning and I look at him in the mirror and I hate who I see. Because deep inside there, this, this, this little kid who gets up every morning and dresses like an adult. And I go out and I, and I try to do what I'm supposed to do, but I can't, okay? I can't be who everybody else expects me to be. God, I can't even be who I wanna be, much less who you created me to be. And so inside is this scared, stupid little kid but you chisel away, just be prepared. You have listened to so many voices for far too long that were not from me. And you have totally bought into the lie, haven't you? You think you're junk, don't you? When you lay your head down at night after you've done the dance to get the hug, you think you're junk. Listen to me, I don't take time to make junk. How can I show you that my love for you stretches as far as the east to the west? That How can I show you that my love for you has no end? I know. Reach in your back pocket. What? Reach in your back pocket. Why? Are you arguing with me? Reach in your back pocket. Oh, God. Yes? I just meant, God, I'll do that right now. You're just saying my name in vain. Come on. It's, it's a name. It's a saying. It's a name above all names. It's more than a saying. It's more than a name. I want to teach you something about my name. Reach in your back pocket. Oh my gosh. You know what that is? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a note. I, I wrote it when I was in college. How did you get this? Hello? Oh yeah. Go ahead, read it. I love Angie. Other side. Sorry. Dear God, did I hear you right today? Did I hear you say that you love me? Even though you and I both know I messed up so many times. Did I hear you say you want to use me? And I feel so useless. If you'll take me, 
then use me then. God, I give you all that I am. Take me. I love you, God. I love you too. And I love you too much just to leave you where you're at. This salvation that you hold, I don't want it to be some sentimental gush or some head knowledge. I want you to work it out in every detail of your life. And when problems come and chaos happens, don't look at it as a, as a prison, but look at it as a father discipline his child. A father disciplines the ones he loves. I know, but it's gonna be tough. Yes, but you bought into the lie thinking everything was gonna be easy when you gave everything over to me. There will be trouble in this world, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I want you to do something. I want you to look out there and I want you to say, Tommy is God's original masterpiece. Tommy is God's... No, not the way you see yourself or you try so desperately for others to see you, but maybe for the first time in your life, the way I see you, the way I created you. Tommy is God's original masterpiece. Yes, you are. And so are you. God doesn't make junk. You are an original masterpiece. First time I watched that video was uh, in a Sunday school class here. Uh, if I remember right, Jeff Lane was teaching a class and um, I just remember having to get past the fact that it was uh, so long. But then again, as you, as you watch it, as you watch it a couple times maybe, um, you understand that, you understand that sometimes what, what we need is just a moment to sit back and look at some things and like a realistic look at things and to understand that <clears throat> exactly what he was illustrating, that um, this life with God is such a, a long uh, walk. Eugene Peterson calls it um, a long obedience in the same direction, going towards God. I, I love that analogy that, you know, it's the thing that I wish everyone could really understand that when you go through those moments in life when you feel like you want to take a little break or whatever it might be, you're really not taking a break. Um, no one ever stays right there. And I just love that portion of it because for every one of us, I think it should speak volumes that if we're not moving towards him, then we're moving away from him. And, and so, you know, in thinking about the subject matter this morning, it's what you've seen, I, I believe, what you've seen is what every believer um, would like to be able to experience, what every believer wishes that they would be able to experience, and that is God speaking personally to them. I mean, if we were all really, really honest about it, wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be a pretty cool thing to just be able to speak that openly and honestly with God and have him to speak that openly with us. But, but here's the other thing that I think so many people miss is that he's all around us and he's speaking at every moment. If we would simply open our, our minds, open our hearts, open our ears, then we would actually hear him speak to us in such a real way because he does. Some of you know that. You know that he does. Some of you long for that. Some of you maybe have never, ever experienced that kind of moment in your life, but you really wish that it could happen for you. Honestly, that part of it is not what we're really here to examine this morning. You see, before we can actually hear from God, before we can hear from him, we need to put ourselves into a position to receive him. 
We need to put ourselves into a position to, to hear from him. I don't mean to harp on this over and over again. You hear this from us all the time. But it goes back to what were you doing last night? It goes back to what was happening in your life, you know, yesterday or even this morning. Um, what, what was happening? In what way were you preparing to come here this morning and to, to receive from God? Because over and over again, you know, I hear people, they expect to hear from places that God really doesn't have in mind to speak to us from. And, and so they come in with those kinds, of, those kinds of expectations to a worship service, thinking that God's going to speak in, in these ways. And God is saying, I really don't, I don't really want to pay attention to, 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 to that particular way. And, and what I mean is styles of worship or, or the, the setting that we're in. I mean, I've told you this before. Some of the places where I've received a word from God and just direction from Him in my life are some of the loneliest places in the world. And it had very little to do with anyone else being around me. But it had to do with my heart being prepared to hear from Him. And so I asked that question. What do you do over and over again in order to pre prepare yourself to, to, to put yourself in a position where you will actually receive and hear from Almighty God, the Creator of all things. These things that draw us close to Him we call spiritual disciplines. It's just a fancy way of saying that we, we use study, we use fasting, we use worship, we use solitude, we use meditation, we use prayer. All of those things are there to prepare us to hear from God. And this morning, our subject is prayer. And yet, at its very basis, I don't know that we always understand what prayer is. In fact, let me just ask that question this morning. What is prayer? What is prayer? What, what is it when we come before God and we begin to lay our hearts before Him? When we begin to ask for Him to work in our lives? Man, so many, so many great scenarios in, in, that, in that video. Um, I heard several people laugh. And I think we laugh at things that touch us the most, that, that hit us where we live. I heard so many people laugh when he said, can we chisel the things that I want to work on? And you remember what God said? God said that would be control. And yet, isn't that how we are? We try to control every aspect of our lives and the areas that God really wants to work on, those are the things that we hold from him or that we think that we hide from him. And, and, and so, so many great, great illustrations that, that demonstrate, probably demonstrate how you and I relate to God. Another one that I think that is there is, is the one that sometimes we think we know ourselves better than He knows us. And so those things that, those things that we think that we can control, those things that we think that we can overcome, we we pull into our own hands and we refuse to give them over to His. I think that sometimes includes the fact that we're afraid that we're going to disappoint Him or that we're afraid that we're going to let Him down. We're afraid that He's not going to love us if He really sees who we are. We're afraid that God will, in some way, forsake us and, and just let us go. But you know, they reinforce that all through the last part of that video. The fact of the matter is, God is not going to let us go. He wants the best for us. He wants us to shine. He wants us to be who He has created us to be. And not an image that we think we should be. And not an image that anyone else thinks that you should be. But He wants you to be who He has created. Whom, I should say, He has created you to be. That's what He wants. And sometimes those things are going to hurt. And always those things come 
because we are willing to hear from him. We're willing to receive. And so at its very base, what is prayer? Some would say prayer is conversation. And you would be correct in that conversation and in, in, in understanding that it is very much a conversation. It's a conversation with Almighty God. But sometimes that's what we forget. It's a conversation with Almighty God. You would probably be very careful in the way that you approached some conversations. Um, if you're approaching someone that you've wounded in some way, you would probably be very uh, cautious. You'd be very caring. If, if you uh, were conversing with someone that you were trying to correct, you would probably be very stern. I mean, if it's someone who deserves your respect, you would be respectful. But for some reason, when we talk about and look at this subject called prayer, we sometimes forget the position that he's in and the position that we're in. Amen? We forget. And I don't want to disqualify the fact that God has come close to us because he gave his son on the cross in order to build that relationship with us. But even then, and when Jesus teaches this model prayer here in Matthew 6, he teaches some elements of respect when we go before our Father. And so more than anything else, prayer is not just relationship, it's not just conversation, it's not a wish list that we make to take before God. You know, he's not the one who's up there looking at our lives and checking our list once or twice. You know, that's not God. Prayer, at its very basis, more than anything else, prayer is worship. I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about it in those terms, but prayer is worship. More than anything else, our prayers are a worship to our God. And what Jesus demonstrates, what he shows us in this text, is that there are some attitudes, there are some pitfalls that can come along that actually undermine our prayers. I mean, that's why he uses these illustrations here in verses 5 through 15. He says, don't pray in this way. Don't pray in this way. Don't pray in this way, but instead, when you pray, pray this. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning. Three attitudes or pitfalls that undermine our prayers. And then we're going to look at the model that Jesus has set forth. And so if you would begin following there in verse 5, Matthew 6, verse 5. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they've received their reward in full, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So when you pray, don't go out on the street corners and, and, and pray as the hypocrites do. For they love the reward of men. But instead, he says, go into your closet and close the door behind you. Pray to the one who hears in secret. Pray to the one who hears in secret. Now, I want to deal with that right off the bat because was Jesus, was he suggesting that all of us be closet prayers? Not at all. In fact, there are plenty of times throughout the scriptures where we see those who offer public prayers. Jesus himself does it in, in John chapter 17. It's sometimes overlooked that Jesus is actually praying that prayer. Sometimes what we do is we take his prayer of John 17 where he's praying, first of all, he prays about the unity that he and the Father have, wishing that unity upon his disciples. So he prays for them and that unity. Then he prays for us. 
I, I don't know, that, that's one of the most humbling passages of Scripture that you can ever read is in John 17 when he begins to pray for those who do not yet believe in him but who will. Those who believe in him though they've never seen him. That's you and me, by the way. He prays for us before he goes to the cross. And it humbles me that even at that moment, in that moment, you and I were on his mind that God cared about us then. And so what some people do is they take that prayer in John 17 and they place it, they, they put it on top of his prayer at Gethsemane. And so many times people believe that he prayed that prayer alone, but in fact he prays it in the presence of his disciples. It's a public prayer that Jesus prays. What Jesus is saying here is that we should never allow the motivation for our prayers to be the people who are watching. Never allow the motivation of our prayers to be the people who are watching. Again, remember what he's battling against. Jesus is teaching what it means to be a true follower and not a pretender, not an actor. That's what he's dealing with through most of these 18 verses that we're looking at in, in John or in, in Matthew uh, chapter 6, that he's dealing with being a true follower and not being someone who puts on a mask, not being a hypocrite. And so he says, don't pray for the wrong reason. Don't, don't go out and pray and put on a show like the Pharisees do. I'm reminded of the story of Lyndon Baines Johnson, um, Bill Moyers, became a journalist. In, fa in fact, he became the press secretary uh, during that period of time. But Bill Moyers was a former minister. And at one point, there was an occasion where Bill was offering a prayer. And Johnson, our president at the time, said, Speak up, man. Now, some of you guys remember... I, I was pretty young when, when Johnson you know, took over the presidency. Some of you guys remember... Um, Lyndon Johnson. Pretty rough character, wasn't he? You know, I mean, wild-eyed southern boy. But I mean, he was, he was a pretty rough character. And so he said to Moyers, speak up, man. And I love Moyers' response. Bill Moyers said, I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to someone who's actually much more powerful than you. You may be powerful here on this earth. You may be powerful here in this nation. But I was talking to our everlasting Father. And what I was saying to Him may have to do with you, but it's really none of your business. How many of us actually, actually come to the public prayer and do that? I have to admit, one of the things that I think happens in public prayer sometimes is it becomes a time for announcement. And Lord, please bless the bake sale that we're having later on today at 2 o'clock. You know, we've all been guilty of that, haven't we? You know, but we're not in that moment to speak to the people. We're there to speak to God. Now, there are times whenever I think our public prayers are meant to guide in some ways. Um, not, not long ago, Brian preached on a Sunday morning, and I heard that... Um, I heard that he put some people in an uncomfortable, uh, you know, kind of an uncomfortable predicament in that they basically, um, they didn't really want to pray together in a group. Sometimes it makes us feel awkward to do that. Um, but, but God is always stretching us in that way. And if we'd really just get into the mindset that whenever we pray like that, what we ought to be doing is, is providing worship and in providing um, a kind of reinforcement to each other about who he is and about what he's done and about what he will do. And so sometimes our prayers, our public prayers, are a guide. And so we offer some guidance and some direction in it. But, but truthfully, when we come before God, we are simply speaking to him. That's why whenever we were at Broadway um, Christian Church and my Uncle Bud would get up every Sunday. His prayer was the same every Sunday. But I knew that when he prayed that prayer, Lord, 
Thank you for just another beautiful day. And thank you for the way that you bless our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Simple, simple words. The thing that I knew about those words is that they were always and they forever would be to God, to Him. See, my uncle had experienced two open heart surgeries, and for him, every day was a beautiful day to have another day with his family, with his loved ones, with his church family. It was a beautiful day. It would be, it would be interesting to see what many, many people in the church would think about his prayer. And simply because of where we're going next with this, because one of the things that Jesus says is don't, don't be a babbler of words. And I want to explain that when we get there, but being a babbler of words has very little to do with the fact that you repeat something, but it has to do with the attitude of the heart and the motivation behind it. Some would say that my my Uncle Bud's prayers um, would be disqualified because he repeated the same prayer over and over again. But what I'm standing here and telling you is if you knew the attitude of his heart, if you knew the motivation behind the prayer, then you would not dare make that claim, but yet there would be some who would. Remember who you are speaking to. And when we're praying publicly, Jesus says, don't let your motivation be the people who are standing around you, but rather allow it to be, allow your motivation to be the fact that you're speaking to Almighty God. So praying as the hypocrites do. Secondly, praying the prayer of the pagan. In verse 7, Jesus calls them babblers. When you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And so He says, don't be like those who just, um, just keep bringing repetition and, and, and bringing uh, just senseless, not, I wouldn't even say senseless, but maybe even selfish motive to it. In fact, let me go back and, and give you a picture of what the babbler might be. You guys remember the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Okay, on one mountainside was Elijah. And it hadn't rained in the land for forever. And, and King Ahab and Jezebel, the queen, they were up in arms against Elijah. They hated him. And so Elijah basically makes this challenge. He says, listen, we're going to send, uh, we're, we're going to pray to our God. We're going to set up a, a place of sacrifice. We're going to pray to our God. You know, you, you uh, 950 or 800, 850, wasn't it? I always do this. Where, where's my, where, where's the Bible research team here? I think it's, uh, it's 850. It's 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Ashtoreth. I'm, I'm not sure, but anyway, there's basically 850, you know, 900 people on this other mountainside. And then there's Elijah on this other mountainside. Elijah says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take water and I want you to drench uh, my sacrifice, this sacrifice to God. I want you to drench it with water. I want you to surround it with a trench of, 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 of water. And just, I mean, just soak it down. And then we'll spend the day and we'll pray Well, here's the great picture because over on that other mountainside, the scriptures talk about how those prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth, they babble their prayers over and over and over again. They get to the point where they're they're so emotionally charged that they begin to cut themselves. They begin to abuse their own bodies because it's as if Baal and Ashtoreth are not hearing their prayers. And of course, we know that they're not hearing their prayers because they don't exist. And then finally that moment comes, that climactic moment comes whenever Elijah calls for fire from heaven and the fire comes down and it consumes not only, not only the meat that is on the altar, not only the altar itself, but it licks up every bit of water that has been poured upon that altar and in that trench around. Because he just 
prayer, pr- praise a simple prayer. It's in the right motivation. And it's not wrapped up. By the way, there's a point in there where, where Elijah yells out to the prophets and he says, he says, yell, pray louder. Pray louder to him. Sing louder to them. Maybe, in fact, he says at one point, maybe he is indisposed at this time and he's using the restroom. I mean, maybe he's asleep. And, and so Jesus says that sometimes what happens is our prayers fall into that same category where we're just babbling the same thing over and over again and the motivation isn't there, the heart isn't there, we're not praying the right things. And, and, and I think, again, if we're listening, God gives us direction, again, in the video. And, and I, I just love, I love the way that the video lays it all out. If you remember, he says, he, he, he begins to want to, to wanna pray his own way. And what, what God keeps pointing out to him is your ways are not my ways, neither you know, are your words my words. And so Jesus simply says, people who pray like this often don't understand the purpose and the direction of their prayers. Because we said that prayer is at its very heart, it's worship, it's relationship. And a great portion of our prayers should be um, used to proclaim God's attributes. Out of 66 words in this prayer, 24 of them focus on who God is, and the other 28 are offered up for our needs in this prayer that we're going to read in just a moment. And so when we pray, I think we should keep a similar balance, remembering who he is, remembering what he has done. And and if you don't want to babble on and on and on, then focus your prayers on God. I'm reminded of Psalm 46.10, where the psalmist simply writes these words, Be still and know that I am God. Sometimes in our prayers we need to be speechless. I get the picture sometimes of a child resting in the lap of his father or mother. Or a child who's walking along an old dusty road and the child with their hand, his or her hand, in the hand of their mother or their father or their grandparents. Simply being together. That's what prayer is. Simply being with the creator of all things. God knows us. Jesus says he already knows our needs. Sometimes prayer is just resting within his arms and just being quiet. I want to say something else to the closet idea of prayer. If you notice, he says, when you do that, understand that what you're doing is you're praying to the one who hears in secret. And and I don't know, you know, I I teach this all the time to people in Bible studies and people who are having a hard time um, praying to God and relating to Him. You know, sometimes the Bible teaches that even when we're at a point where we don't know how to put into words our prayers, that if we'll just simply go to God and open our hearts up to Him, that the Holy Spirit actually prays for us. And so often what I teach is this, and, and, and for some people, some people are like, that's just, that's such a strange teaching. But I'm going to tell you something, if you've never faced strong, strong temptation, then, then, then you probably won't understand this. But there are times that people are sometimes afraid to pray for things like strength in certain areas. Because they know when they pray for strength in certain areas that we have an enemy who is there and that he knows that when we voice that prayer that we're facing a struggle at that moment. And I hear people all the time who come in and and counsel with me and they will tell me, I just, I I come to a point where I really don't want to pray that prayer anymore. And so what I suggest for them to do is just simply pray it in here. To pray it in here. And to pray it in here. Because when we do that, there's only one who knows your thoughts. There's only one who knows your heart. And it's hard to convince some people, those who try to set up 
God and Satan in this dualistic you know, view that they have, that they are equally powerful, that, that every evil thing or every bad thing, I should say, every bad thing that happens has Satan's name you know, on it, you know, punched on it. it. But understand that there's only one who knows our hearts and who knows our thoughts. Satan cannot know your thoughts. Now, he can know your behavior. Why? Because he watches you. He watches you. He and his minions watch us. They know us. They know what trips us up. And so, oftentimes, I love what Jesus teaches here because he says, go into your closet and pray, and pray to the one who hears in secret. Because he's the only one who knows your heart. And he knows your thoughts. Well, then finally, Jesus says that we need to be willing, um, well, actually praying the prayer of prejudice is the last hindrance. And so, um, look at verses 9 and following. We'll go through verse 15. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And evidently what Jesus is, is instructing here is that as we pray, that what we need to pray is a prayer that will change our hearts, that will change our focus, that will change our very lives. This one may be the most difficult issue to deal with when it comes to praying because he's saying that we as his followers must be willing to forgive those who sin against us to let go of the things that they've done against us. He's already taught about forgiveness two or three times before this, and he will continue to teach on that subject through.